So yesterday we started with Winke Gieseman, one of the founders. Today we'll start with the other founder, Johan Stocking. He's the CTO of the Things Industry and the tech lead of the Things Network. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Johan Stocking. <laughs> Oh, there we go. That's our first prototype. <laughs> it's uh, not very, uh, not very, not a very good build quality. I will come back to that later. Hi, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks for showing up. Uh, I got a flat tire this morning, but uh, fortunately the Uber was there uh, just in time for me to uh, to be here. Um, very nice to see all of you. Uh, I had a great day yesterday. A lot of interesting talks. Uh, a lot of good workshops. A lot of people. Um, today uh, we have a few people less than yesterday, um, but it was very, very good to have the Laurel Lions here uh, yesterday. Um, when we started with the Things Network, um, <coughs> uh, we d there was some, you know, people were were very hesitant to to work with us because we were we were super disruptive. We were changing the business model uh, of of many classical uh, telecom operators. Uh, but now it's very nice to see that we that we have very good partners within the Laura Alliance, uh, and that we're also working with these telecom operators, and that they actually come to our conference. So I think that's I'm I'm very happy with that. So um, yeah, where <clears throat> when it started, so um, I want to take a few steps back also, um, and I do that because I think that's important to um <clears throat> to give you a bit of an understanding of uh, why we do things and. Uh, why we do things in, in a certain way. So um, <clears throat> when uh, when Wink and I met up in the summer of 2015 for a cup of coffee, uh, we both shared the uh, the drive to do something new, something scalable, something uh, ready for the future. And we both had our freelance projects jobs on the side, so uh, we didn't have to uh, make money, we didn't have to raise uh, venture capital or anything. Uh, we were just very interested in technology and we wanted to spend time on something that could grow potentially uh, very big. And um, <coughs> uh, Wienke and I, we, you know, we were just internet entrepreneurs and uh, he had been to the IoT meetup uh, here in Amsterdam. And um, there, uh, there was KPN, the big national uh, Dutch operator, and they announced the uh, national rollout of their LoRaWAN network. And so we got to learn about LoRaWAN, and we learned that LoRaWAN is about um, messaging, about security, about network management, uh, and we also learned about LoRa, uh, the underlying modulation that you can uh, communicate over kilometers of range, uh, even within cities. Uh, that is very high network capacity, very different than other uh, wireless technologies that are being used for the Internet of Things. Um, so this was really a, a learning experience for us, and we also learned that LoRa is, is being used in the ISM bands, so you don't need to have a license, so you can build a network yourself. And we decided to do that. We decided to, to build a network and to do the same thing, but then uh, very different. So um, we didn't want to build a proprietary stack. Uh, we didn't want to do... Uh, centralized routing. We didn't want to have one data center where all the traffic would go through. Uh, finally, we um, uh, didn't want to own the infrastructure. We didn't want to raise uh, millions of euros to buy thousands of gateways and deploy them all over the place. But instead, we wanted to do it open. We wanted to do it. Uh, we wanted to do it open source to to build a network server that everyone can reuse. And open also means here that people can connect their own gateways to it uh, without having any other rules than just our, our simple manifest. Uh, we also wanted to do it crowdsourced, so we didn't want to own the infrastructure. And finally, uh, we, didn't wanna, uh, we wanted to do it decentralized. So we formulated our mission and we presented this at the IoT meetup in Amsterdam. And um, uh, we called it the Things Network. And that is really how it started, only in a few weeks. And so our drive is really to make the connectivity a commodity and that messaging should be free. And this is really following the success of the internet. So for example, uh, email replaced uh, postal mail 
It's not only because it's a convenience, but also because you don't have to pay uh, for a digital stamp to put on your email to send it. And the same with SMS. Uh, it, it costs you, even if it's only a few cents, what became really popular was WhatsApp and iMessage. It's also because messaging is free. And, and that also made us think of business models in the IoT. And carriers, they charge um, per message in, in their commercial or WAN networks. Uh, but those business models are, are 20 years old. We, we don't, I don't believe in that at all. The value is elsewhere. Value is in services, in high quality sensors, in applications, in convenience, in buying a box solution, installing that somewhere, um, but not in the messaging itself. So um, we, we took the internet as an example. And if you look at the internet, for example, everyone knows, you know, if you do a trace route from, from here to uh, the, this is the, the from, from my home to uh, the website of Meshed in Australia, that's our Australian partner, uh, that's the other side of the world, you, you pass a lot of gateways and nobody knows these, well, I don't know these parties, but still the, this is transit, this is peering, this is networks that have agreements with each other, uh, commercial networks in this case, um, but this makes one big global network. And that was, that was a, actually an example for, um, for us. And when you start a network like that, you don't have any coverage in the beginning. So, um, uh, but at the same time, it's very easy to, to add coverage where you need it. So you also have full control over the network. And uh, you don't have to call your telecom operator saying, hey, uh, please uh, install a gateway here because you know, I have a sensor in my basement. Uh, but you can you can actually set up a gateway yourself. Um, so so that's really the core of the network. You are the network. We have more than 2,600 gateways connected. Uh, that's you know that's a lot, um, and it's installed by the community. And I often get the, the question, hey, who who is in your community? What kind of people are that? What kind of companies? What is what is the community? And so our community is individual enthusiasts. Um, Techno-anarchists, people that want to build alternative networks. It's, it's really cool. It's also very close to our heart. Uh, educational institutes that use LoRaWAN for R&D. Uh, startups that are trying out, that are using the free network to try out new business models. Uh, they stay on TTN, they go to private networks based on TTN, or they go to commercial networks, that's all fine. Um, and. Um, uh, and, and together, that's and also there are also corporates on, on TTN. It's, just, it's, a, it's a whole mix of, and that's also what you see in the most, in the most active and most successful communities on TTN. It's a very healthy mix of, of all kinds of parties, and those 2,600 gateways are all installed by all these different parties. And even though the Things Network Foundation uh, has, you know, we have our burn rate, we have our operational expenses. Uh, but the real investment is done by the community. Uh, the community installs, you know, the, the, this is the equivalent of, of, of millions and millions of euros of installed base, of gateways that are bought, um, connectivity, uh, uh, power supply, you know, all those small things together in these numbers, uh, that's very big. And, and just let alone the time that people spend on, on building this network without having any business model behind it. Um, so, we route about 4 million messages per day, uh, which I think is quite a lot. It's on our public network. And so what does that look like? Um, well, it's very hard to, to animate that. So uh, what I always very much like is uh, when we need to log in our log files to, to, to find something to, if something is not working well. Um, so then we SSH into, for example, the EU region, and we type you know, Docker Compose logs. Uh, enter, and um, what you see uh, then is basically a lot of data. So you see uh, uplink messages, uh, gateway statuses, downlink messages, uh, and this goes on all the time, 24 hours a day, because most IoT devices, they don't know the difference between day and night. Um, this is only the public region. Then, of course, we also have the, some private networks based on TTN, uh, open source private networks, commercial private networks. And um, on, on our public gateways, uh, we are trying to, to get more insight in this network to see 
um, how it is being used and uh, what the geographic spread is, uh, where the density is, uh, what the channel utilization is of gateways. Um, so we now have an internal data science um, uh, project. It's a, a master thesis research uh, project, very interesting. And um, one of the things we want to know is uh, how much traffic that we receive on the public network is actually for TTN. And um, worldwide, this is uh, more than 61%. So of all the packets that receive on TTN, are received on TTN gateways are actually for TTN. So 39% is the rest, that's uh, garbage, that's other networks, uh, could be uh, open networks also, but uh, mostly uh, commercial networks. So private commercial networks or public commercial networks. And um, I think 61% is a very good uh, percentage, but of course you have to take into account that there is also areas where there's no coverage and where other networks are more popular. But I will get back to that later because we want to bring that together. So let's go back a few, uh, few steps back to uh, the summer of 2015 when we started the Things Network and when we basically in, in five minutes made this slide uh, that was kind of an illustration of how we would cover the city of Amsterdam with, uh, with you know, 10 gateways. And, and so what Winke did was he reached out to companies we used to work for, uh, companies that had a good location uh, where we could place a gateway on a, in a good spot. And I started building the backend. So I, with a friend, we started with um, our first version. Croft, um, it's called Laura Croft, uh, thought it was a good name. <laughs> and, uh, I, it, you know, I had to pick a programming language. I had a background in .NET development, C Sharp, but we wanted to create an open source community behind it. So we thought, you know, if you go for that kind of tooling, then uh, that's not very inclusive for the open source world. So we decided to go for Go, but I didn't know anything about Go, so it was, it was a very interesting learning process. And within four weeks, we, um, we actually built the first network. And, um, uh, but we needed a prototype. And so we live in Amsterdam, and um, you know, I think a lot of you know this story, but it's, I think it's very good to, 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 to mention this time after time, because uh, the power of LoRa is really in very, very simple use cases. Uh, that enable, enable new things. So it's not only a very good replacement for existing wireless connectivity, but it also allows for very new use cases that nobody had ever thought of. And I think the mousetrap is a very good example for that. We started with the uh, boat sensor. And um, this is just a photo in the canal. And you, know, you have boats running water. And um, if you want to monitor your boats, you can't use Wi-Fi because you don't know the passwords of wireless access points around you. You can't use Bluetooth because the range is too short. If you have uh, your, your phone in range, you might as well look in the boat if there's water. Uh, if you use a cellular connection, that's going to be very expensive. Um, and so uh, LoRa is actually a very good um, technology to monitor a boat. It's, it's super simple. So what we built is, um, is this. This was the, uh, the first prototype. It's a 3D printed uh, thing. It's, um, I, I don't think it's waterproof, but um, if you, uh, it worked. So if you would make this a bit wet with water, not the whole thing, because then it would break with an antenna on top. And, uh, and yeah, this is basically where we, where we came from. This is the first, the first things that we, that we, uh, that we built. And uh, we, we, we came a long way. Um, then we did our launching conference uh, in August 2015. Who was there? Who was here? Oh, very nice. Still see a few. It's very cool. Yeah, it's uh, very nice. Um, and so this is a bit of our history, and it's important to know because this is where we came from, and this is also what a lot of decisions are based on when it comes to the technology. So moving forward, what do we need? Where are we currently, and what do we need in the future? So there's very little certification. Uh, and with certification, I mean uh, not only LoRaWAN certification, but also uh, EC, FCC certification, and that you can be sure that it works, it's tested, uh, you build a new product, and it's not too expensive to get it certified. Um, so we need full certification. It's not only of the end device, but I think we also need um, uh, certification in the whole network. 
So it would be very nice if we could, for example, uh, certify our network server and that the LoRa Alliance would have a program to certify network servers so you can be sure as a device maker, if you have a certified device, that it works on a certified network server. Um, Geolocalization was also one of the topics yesterday. It's very unreliable today. And I think it should be better and it should be smart and we have to combine technologies. Uh, like Richard presented in his presentation, we need to combine time difference of arrival with RSSI, with Wi-Fi. Um, and also, the device has to know in the first place where it is uh, before it can communicate, uh, like Nicholas um, presented in his presentation yesterday as well. Um, so that is, yeah, the geolocalization has to be a mix of sources. Uh, I think also we need to receive this metadata from other networks. We don't have to enable roaming per se, um, but since all the gateways receive all the traffic anyway, why not, you know, why not send the metadata to the home network um, so that we can do better geolocalization? Uh, also, I think um, you shouldn't care about how the algorithms exactly work if you don't want to care about it. So it should be best effort. You just throw data at a surface and get a location back with the, with the precision. And it should be asynchronous because those location solvers are quite slow. So it can't be part of the uplink and downlink message flow because, as you know, LoRaWAN is quite time critical. So those are some requirements that, that, are, that we have. And um, yeah, very happy to see that we now get that integration with, um, with uh, Colos. Um, so like Richard announced yesterday, um, you can sign up from about next week. We enable the integration in the, in the public community network uh, console. And it's, it's, like a, it's like a messaging integration. It's very much like enabling the HTTP integration, for example. Uh, you sign up at Colos also, you paste your API key in there, and uh, that allows you to uh, use localization, whether it is time difference of arrival, or RSSI, or, um, or um, Wi-Fi access points. And uh, I did a quick test with just the, the things Uno and an ESP to scan the uh, Wi-Fi access points and just sending three um, MAC addresses with the RSSI and walk around here in this building. Uh, and yeah, as you can see, it's, it's, it's super accurate. This is actually where I was walking when I did this test in this, uh, in this building. Um, so I think that's, um, that's very promising. Yeah, and device updates. Um, as you also, as Jan presented yesterday, uh, we've been working uh, with, with ARM, with the LoRa Alliance on firmware updates over the air. It's super important to be able to patch security issues, to upgrade your stack, to upgrade to LoRaWAN 2.0 on existing devices, for example, um, to, uh, to, to save power by using a new algorithm or to specialize devices or to rotate keys. You have to, you have, to have this update channel. If you don't have it, you, you can't just ship a million devices from your factory in China if you don't have an update channel. Um, same goes for security. A lot of, also in, in the workshops that we give, you know, it's just for convenience, we program all the keys just in code and it's, uh, it's going to be, it's, it's flashed on the device, but the keys are just, it's very easy to read the keys. So that's in the end device. We need secure elements there. Um, but also we need a trusted join procedure. So we need to, we need, you need to be able to buy secure modules um, that are whether or not integrated with the LoRaWAN module, but you need to be able to put that on your PCB uh, where there are app keys inside, root keys, um, that will never be exposed. And the, because LoRaWAN is symmetric, the root key should also be in a joint server, a trusted third-party joint server. You can run your own joint server to have full control over this. This is also what we will be enabling with our, the new version of our stack. Um, but um, uh, this should also be supported by the industry. So there are now within the LoRa Alliance uh, companies that are uh, building these joint servers and also making them available um, so that the, we decouple the security procedure, the key derivation from uh, the routing. And um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's also key for, uh, for the future. Interoperability is also very, very important. Uh, it's also is related to the join. Uh, but also to peering and roaming. 
Um, so we need to exchange traffic. We need to exchange traffic within the TTN ecosystem, like we do already with our public regions. Uh, but we also want to do this with private networks and private to private networks, and even um, with uh, LoRa Alliance uh, partners to enable, for example, passive roaming or handover roaming uh, with other networks when they have coverage and our network doesn't have coverage. Finally, today it's a mix of a bunch of components. Um, it's very a lot of grey matter, and I think we need to go to integrated solutions where um, you can just buy a solution in a box, or you can um, you you have integrations with with uh, IoT platforms you know, or with cloud platforms you know, and I think currently when when you're new to LoRaWAN, you, you don't know where to start. You have modules, you have network servers, uh, IoT platforms, all kinds of messaging protocols. You have to know about power consumption, about payload formats. And um, that's, um, I, think, I think this is, we see a role for us, especially in these topics, to, um, to move forward and to work on this. So this is, these are all the things that we, we are working on today, and we've also been working on this uh, in, in, the, in the past months. So regarding that developer ecosystem, I think that's, that's really, really important to enable that. If you build a prototype, you can start with a Raspberry Pi, you can start with Node.js, with Node.red, and you're basically using the wrong technology, uh, because this doesn't scale in any direction. But um, you can very easily you know, show a working solution. You can, you can show it to people. Um, uh, but from there, from building your first batch, you're using completely different technologies. You have to use an embedded operating system. You go for Arduino or ARM Embed. Uh, you can use LoRa already here, uh, maybe BLE also. And then your prototype uh, looks very much like that, just a, you know, a developer kit, basically, with the battery, some custom sensors, build an application on top of that, uh, maybe put a nice case around it. You, you can get away with that if you build only 200 or 300 units. Uh, you, don't, you, don't need, you don't need custom PCB design. But if you go for big scale, from uh, a thousand to a million, for example, um, maybe you don't need to know assembly, but you have to understand what your uh, device is doing, how, it's, how much memory it, it, it is using, if there's any memory leak, where it comes from, if you have 10-year uh, lifetime of your devices, and you need to design your own, your own PCB. And so what this basically means is that if you move from prototyping to a first batch to large-scale production, uh, you have to learn different technologies all the time. And it's a, it's a whole different, uh, it's, it's different scales uh, that you need to, to know. And um, what, what we really see is actually that the magic happens there, uh, the, the, the mass deployments, uh, devices that are that are made you know, in, the, in the thousands and tens of thousands at the same time. But the comfort zone of most of the developers is JavaScript, is you know, de deploying a Node.js application and uh, building you know, a very simple application in a browser on, on, on mobile. And so we need to bring that together uh, to, to make IoT really scale. We need to make this more accessible. And there are different technologies that, that enable that. So we have, you know, like I said, ARM Embed is a very good operating system to build your code in. Um, JavaScript even allows you to run JavaScript on an MCU. Uh, we have the big cloud platforms, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, uh, that also have IoT endpoints to, to work with a lot of data at the same time to allow for um, uh, messages and storage, processing, Lambda functions, serverless computing. Um, and also we see that other you know, higher level languages are also becoming more and more available in the end devices. And so we really see a role for us to bridge that, to bridge the existing developers, uh, the developer comfort zone with um, hardware engineers, to bridge hardware engineers with developers, uh, and to make it very easy on, for both type of developers to, to, to build solutions together. And as an example, um, you know, for example, the banana use case, um, this is uh, you know, just, just to show what it needs when you, when you actually build an end-to-end -end solution. For example, when you, when you have a, a banana company 
uh, transportation. So this is my grandfather, you see here on the left. Uh, he had a wholesale in, um, in bananas and vegetables and other things. And um, when you harvest bananas uh, in South America, for example, they are still green. And the time between harvestation and consumption is about three to four weeks. But the ripening process uh, can be a process of four to eight days. And it depends uh, on, the, um, uh, on the temperature and the amount of ethylene gas. So they can transport it on a ship in special containers. Those containers, they are regulated. They can, you can control the temperature. You can contr control the ethylene gas uh, throughout the way. And um, it's, so it's a very delicate product. And um, uh, if you have these bananas in the shop, then they have to be yellow. Uh, and, and, and really, it's, 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 really, it's a really delicate pro process. So what you want to do when you build a solution for this is that you want to have to want to connect this chain end to end. From the farm, transportation, everywhere, you need to be able to control this uh, remotely. And um, uh, also when these uh, bananas are in these containers. So, Let's say you want to build this banana ripening app. This is your solution. It's a very industrial solution. Um, but I think it's a very good use case where, where Laura Wen can fit in. Uh, you, can, you, want to, yeah, you want to control the temperature throughout the chain, humidity and the uh, ethylene gas. And you can use the Things Network for that, uh, the public network, private network, but especially with V3, our new stack, uh, the combination of these. Um, because on a farm, you can set up a private network. You can put a gateway on a pole, and uh, you can cover the entire farm. Um, so that's the combination of a private and a public network. On a ship, um, you probably don't have an internet connection. You may have a gateway with a satellite backhaul. Um, and also, as Thomas um, uh, presented yesterday, this may be a use case where you can also follow your, um, your goods when they are on the ocean uh, by having satellites flying over it that won't allow you to control it because there's probably no way of downlink, but at least you would be able to monitor it. But I think having a satellite backhaul on a gateway with the gateway on the ship, um, that, that is actually going to work. Transportation, same thing on a truck. You can have a very simple gateway, uh, but you can also there, when the truck drives tr through a country with a lot of public LoRaWAN networks, you can also use those to uh, to gather all the information. And the same in storage. So storage, big cool cells, it's very hard to get uh, coverage in there uh, from, from public networks. So you also need to place a gateway there. And finally, also in the shop. So this is a combination of public, private networks, offline networks, satellite backhauls, uh, single gateway networks, maybe even different uh, regional parameters that you need to use because South America, there are different regulations than here in Europe, for example. And um, uh, this gives basically an idea of how broad the deployment models are for LoRaWAN networks. And this is also something that we have learned uh, in, the, in the last years when we built um, the Things Network. So first we have the um, the public networks, the uh, public community network, as you know it, but also public operated networks that uh, use our stack uh, in their commercial network. It's also a possibility. Then private networks. Uh, private could be software as a service, could be private clouds, could be on-premises. Uh, it could be uh, Pico networks with a single gateway. It could be offline networks that don't even have an internet connection. Uh, and finally, there's LoRaWAN development. That's also a deployment scenario where you as a device maker need to have a very controlled environment. You need to be able to run the stack on your laptop and really see what's going on without having any other traffic. Because when you look at the log file that I just showed about the, uh, the, from, from the EU uh, region, there's no way that you're going to debug one single device if you, if, you, if you have that. So LoRaWAN development is also um, something that we are addressing when we build our stack. And so um, our new stack, version three, uh, I also announced it last week in the webinar. I don't know how many people saw the webinar last week. Okay, very good. Ah, nice. So there's a few uh, reiterations, but I think it's I can't you know talk enough of our stack. So um, you're just gonna I'm just gonna talk about it anyway. Um, 
we are supporting LoRaWAN 1.1, 1.0, 2, and 1.0. Uh, there is three official specifications that the technical committee released. Um, it's going to run as a single binary, so you can just get one binary for different processor architectures, different operating systems, and that's the whole thing. All the components are in there, but you can also um, deploy our stack as specialized microservices. Uh, scales a bit better. It supports peering within the Things Network ecosystem. I'll explain a bit later uh, what that is. And also, we are going to implement the roaming interfaces, um, the, the LoRaWAN backend interfaces to, to uh, support passive and handover uh, roaming. Uh, but m I think most importantly, because I'm, I'm not sure if we're going to use it actually on, on the public network, but most importantly, uh, support for those uh, trusted third-party joint servers. And um, yeah, we are releasing the, the MVP, the, 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 yeah, like a very rogue, but at least first version of the stack in, uh, in March. And then uh, later on in June and July, uh, it will be available for private networks. And then we we'll also transition the public community network. Uh, which is actually one of the most uh, challenging uh, things, I think, of this year uh, to do. Um, and yeah, of course, uh, finally, all the components are open source. So where with our current V2 stack, not everything was open source. The console wasn't open source. The account server wasn't open source. We actually make this open source. So it's a self-containing stack uh, to run private networks uh, based on TTN technology. So when we started with the first version, so the, the version that I built while learning Go, uh, version zero, um, it, um, it, it wasn't actually good at anything. We didn't have a device registry. We didn't have um, uh, any user users, no security. Uh, we didn't support over the air activation. Um, uh, so everyone shared the same keys. There was one public MQTT broker where you could subscribe to all the data. Uh, there was one Node-RED environment, which was, I think, the most chaotic Node-RED environment ever. And um, that was really our, our MVP. So we, we needed to have something, uh, something better, so version 1, but we rushed it uh, because version 0 was so bad. So the design was good, but um, uh, the, yeah, the, I think the, the architecture wasn't worked out uh, the way we, we wanted to have, but it was already much better for running a public network because there were accounts, there was over the air activation, uh, and it could also run for private networks. And then uh, we released version 2 in uh, November, December in 2016, and this is our current stack. So, um, and our focus has really been on the public network. So this is the, the stack that is processing uh, 4 million messages per day and uh, 2,600 networks on the public network. Uh, it also works quite well on private networks, but it's really designed for, for public networks. Um, and, um, but to set it up for, for private networks, and we have a tutorial for that on our website, it, it takes you the whole afternoon to set it up. Uh, you have to set up, you know, all kinds of tokens and components and run 20 microservices at the same time. And uh, th that is actually because it's designed, designed for, for public networks. So that's something that we, that we realized that it's too hard to set up for on-premises, uh, private cloud, Pico networks, offline networks. Uh, and we wanted to, um, and it's also not very useful for LoRaWAN development, like I said. It's, very, it's, not, it's not like your, your tool to uh, use as a network server while you are building end devices. So version three is addressing all of these deployment scenarios, uh, all at the same time. And um, uh, so we, we are fixing everything. Uh, and actually, it's, uh, it's quite challenging, <laughs> as you can imagine. Uh, but uh, at the same time, if you, uh, if you think about it, uh, it, it it's, it's also just a matter of just good design. And, and you know, taking some considerations into account. For example, we chose for a library first design where all the components are, are essentially libraries. So you can load them in, in one binary that just does just that, or uh, a binary that loads uh, 10 other uh, libraries uh, and has everything integrated in one. Um, so
So yeah, we want to do it right. Uh, quality first. It's a big project. We already started this in August uh, last year, the first designs and first implementation. So we're already months and months in development. And there's no need to hurry. I mean, V2 is, is really good. Um, 1.1 is still, you know, there's still no uh, end device stack that's let alone certified. But, you know, there are no LoRaWAN 1.1 devices on the market yet. Uh, so there's, there's no need to rush this. Uh, but we are, you know, we are having strong demand for private networks and also from people in the community that want to run their own cluster, uh, their own private cluster and connect that to the public network. Um, so that it, it will come in the summer um, and it's a, it's a big project addressing all these deployment scenarios. So the base components are um, a gateway server, the network server, application server, joint server, identity server. Um, and uh, on the integration side, we have our base integration, MQTT integration, uh, and of course also the HTTP integration and many others. But on the gateway side, we also build a gateway agent. And the gateway agent is a process that runs on Linux-based gateways. And uh, it, it, it runs next to the, the packet forwarder, a, a Semtech UDP-based packet forwarder. So we try to build our own packet forwarder, um, directly communicating with the, the hull. Uh, it wasn't a big success, uh, memory issues, um, but also a lot of dependencies uh, and, and stuff. And what we actually see is that um, uh, Semtech, but also other developers, are very committed to, to having a UDP-based packet forwarder in their gateway. But you don't want to use UDP as a transport to your network server. And it also doesn't allow for um, remote configuration and for updating the frequency plan. So the, the agent is really just that. It works with the locally running packet forwarder. So the packet forwarder is pointing to local host, and the agent picks up the UDP traffic and has a secure and encrypted connection with the network server. And this allows for remote configuration and updates. And it also is quite easy for us because we outsource that whole cross-compilation and implementation of a whole of different uh, reference design gateways to uh, the implementers of that UDP packet forwarder. Um, also, we will be packaging this for popular gateways, so you don't have to worry about you know, those two processes. It's going to be one package with both uh, for the popular gateway models. And as this is also all open source, you can also package this yourself if you build your own custom gateways, for example. Also, we're adding low bandwidth mode, and that's um, very useful for uh, gateways that are on a cellular connection uh, or on a satellite backhaul where you pay for the traffic of the gateway. And uh, low bandwidth mode means that you can set filters on the device addresses that it actually sends as uplink. So you can already filter out, for example, only the TTN traffic uh, before it's uh, sent over the line. Um, and uh, that will save, uh, save some costs there. Gateway server is uh, basically maintains the connection with the gateway agents or with the gateways, because we will also support, of course, the UDP uh, gateways. Um, and also manages the gateway's duty cycle. Uh, it's quite important in LoRaWAN, especially here in Europe. And it forwards the uplink traffic to the network server or to the pairing broker. And I will get back on that later, what that exactly is. Um, it also serves the frequency plan to the gateway. Um, so you can remotely configure the frequency plan. Network server handles the Mac layer of the different LoRaWAN versions, uh, supporting class A, B, and C. And uh, we keep the max state uh, per device. So this is also in V2. This is um, a bit different, but it also allows you to tune per device the radio settings. So you can, for example, increase the RX1 uh, uh, delay uh, from one second by default to, for example, five seconds. Um, and we also want to make this more automated. So for example, when there is a join on a gateway with a very high latency because it's a 3G backhaul or satellite backhaul. We may already increase the RX1 window automatically uh, to, uh, to, uh, to a higher um, uh, delay. Uh, the application server, um, I think the biggest change there uh, is that we uh, are uh, supporting extended support for payload formats. So I think one of the most powerful and popular features in, uh, in the handler today or in, in, in the console is the payload formats where you can uh, write your little JavaScript functions to decode binary payload into a JSON object and back with an encoder. Still, you have to write this code even for off-the-shelf devices. 
and it's a payload function that is for your whole application. So we are changing that, it's going to be per device, and we will be having a public repository on GitHub where device makers can uh, open a pull request and submit their uh, payload function for that device, and it will be available in the console by just selecting the brand, model, and version of the end device, and you will not have to bother about um, binary payload formats again, especially not for off-the-shelf devices. Um, also, you will be able to manage these devices in groups. Uh, so if you, if you have thousands of devices, uh, people stopped using the console, um, instead started using the API or TTN CTL, command line utility. Um, and this is also uh, something that we will we having better support for. And finally, uh, here is also the place where we, there will be plug-in uh, plugins like integrations for geolocalization. And the first integration that we will be supporting here is Colos, but it's, this is also open, so if you want to use your own geolocalization service, that's fine. Uh, you can just integrate that in the V3 application server. Um, integrations, so this is messaging integrations. We have MQTT, HTTP, but also um, more optional and zero effort integrations with existing IoT platforms. And uh, just a few weeks ago, we released the integration for uh, Amazon Web Services IoT, uh, and that does everything for you. Messaging, uh, device uh, registry synchronization, device shadows, uh, you don't, if, once you enable the integration, you don't need to use our console anymore uh, to create devices or to update devices. Uh, everything goes through uh, AWS IoT. And for many web developers, that brings LoRaWAN into their comfort zone because they are used to using Amazon Web Services for hosting, for their database, uh, and they think, okay, I can use AWS IoT uh, for my LoRaWAN network. Um, that, that makes perfect sense for, for that kind of developer. Um, so, you know, enabling that integration, it's very easy, just a few steps. Um, I understood from uh, Sander yesterday, who gave a presentation on serverless, that we can make this even better uh, than it is today. So I'm not an AWS expert, but I'm happy to hear from him what his uh, advice is. Um, so you enter your app ID, your, your app access key, uh, just a few other things. You click some buttons. So this is in your account, in your AWS account. This is also where the integration runs. It's in your own security context. Um, and that deploys a new stack to CloudFormation. Uh, you don't have to remember all this if you're not familiar to it, but as an AWS developer, this is, this is very easy to, to set up an integration with a public or private things network. And it also allows you to very quickly get uh, uh, charts and graphics of your, um, of your data. So for example, this is our office uh, temperature and light levels uh, by just using AWS built-in uh, technologies. It's, it's very simple to, uh, to get started with this. So the console, uh, we're going to make the version 3 console open source. It will have a new navigation. I think the console is already uh, one of our nicest products that we have in, uh, in the stack. Uh, we also get a lot of compliments uh, on the console, especially compared to other network servers. Uh, but we are still approving the look and, uh, and the navigation. Uh, Identity Server is responsible for um, the users, gateways, uh, applications, and the rights, collaborators. It's also going to be open source. It also issues the security tokens, so it's, you can integrate it also in a single sign-on flow. Um, and we will be adding support for organizations. So you can create teams of people with users, and you can make an organization a collaborator to a gateway or to an application. And all the users in that organization uh, inherit that right. Uh, on the security side, um, the new component, the joint server, and the joint server stores the root keys of the uh, devices and derives the session keys. And these session keys are needed by the network server and the application server uh, for the routing. And you can deploy your own joint server in your own on-premise trusted environment on your own server as long as it's available even for a public uh, the public TTN network, it will use your on-premises on joint server and your on-premises joint server gives the session keys to the public network so the public network can do the routing by staying in full control over your keys. But we will also support uh, trusted third-party joint servers uh, that are run by, uh, by 
big security companies like uh, Gemalto, uh, Wiseki, Idemia, uh, Script, uh, they will offer this as a hosted um, and often commercial solution. Um, so you can be in full control over your security keys and um, this also gives you the power to switch uh, v3 clusters. So you can start with your own journey server on the public network, but you can also um, you know, uh, configure in your joint server that you want to use another v3 cluster, whether or not it's private or public, uh, while still staying in control over your keys. You did makes it very, very much easier to migrate your uh, devices. Uh, LoRa Alliance interoperability. So this is implementing the uh, LoRaWAN backend interfaces. Uh, doesn't have a high priority for us. Uh, what does have a high priority is then the third-party joint servers. So it's the same story, um, but this, these are joint servers that are operated by these um, security companies. So the public community network, that's our number one priority, uh, the free network, and um, currently we, Things Network Foundation operates four regions in EU, in Singapore, Brazil, and US. Uh, then we have um, a Swiss association, um, uh, Gonzalo is one of the founders of that in Zurich, um, uh, and uh, they are also operating a public cluster. And then in Australia, there's Meshed. Um, uh, Andrew is also here uh, from Australia. He's an operating also a public cluster in Australia. And we want to have more of these because we want to decentralize the network further. With V2, it's quite hard. There will be a panel tomorrow, uh, by the way, about decentralization. Uh, I will also be on the panel. We can, we can dive deep into the details about this. Um, and we have ongoing conversations with uh, universities, with other foundations, uh, to become part of the network and to, do, to start also to, to deploy a public cluster. And this is really adding uh, capacity to the public network. Uh, and we are also requesting uh, proposals from, from people in the community that are willing to run a public cluster. Private networks. Um, private networks are networks that are for a single purpose. Could could be a city, just a city. Uh, it could still be a public network, but then just private to that city. Uh, it could also be a commercial for commercial applications. Um, you, you, there are different use cases for private networks, and V3 allows you to operate your own private cluster because it's a self-containing stack. Um, so it's independent and you can build these private clusters from source. So because everything is open source, you can just clone the repository and you know, install all the dependencies and developer de dependencies, build it from source. Um, but we also make uh, binaries available for different operating systems, different uh, processor architectures. So you can just run a binary. Uh, you can also um, run that as a single binary or as microservices that are specialized. Uh, you can use Docker images, um, but of course, to make it convenient, hosted solutions with uh, service level agreements on the availability are also available through Things Industries, uh, through partners, and, um, uh, and, and this is really something where we see our stack really as, as the kind of Apache web server or Nginx web server, but then for LoRaWAN. So it's open source but it will also be available through hosting partners optionally, but you can do it yourself. Then peering. Um, so peering, like I just said, th those public clusters, that is public to public peering. So we, it's all public networks, everyone can register. It's, it's the same pool of users and applications, um, but there is uh, exchange of traffic between these public clusters. Then there's also public to private peering, and that is exchanging traffic between the public community network and private networks, and there's private to private peering. And I think the, the most interesting, what we get a lot of questions about is how, how, how are you gonna do public to private peering? Um, and the way we do this is by being able, if you run a private network, to enable peering optionally with the public network. And that means that um, when your private network receives a message that is for the public network, you offload it to the public network. And at the same time, um, when the public network receives a message for a private network, it will be sent to that private network. That's basically how it works. It's very simple. But in order 
to be fair and to not have private networks piggybacking on the public network, the rule is that this has to be in balance. So private networks, if a private network contributes a thousand messages of, for the public network to the public network, then it gets a thousand messages back. And it also works for downlink. So that means that private networks benefit from ambient coverage of the public network, but they are still in full control over the infrastructure and they contribute back to the public network. And I think that in the end, this will create a lot of coverage, uh, extra coverage for the public network. Um, the Things Network Foundation uh, charges a fee, and this is more for the maintenance, cover the operational costs, and the address space. Uh, private networks need address space. Um, and uh, this, is, this is really to, to, yeah, to, to cover our operational costs. Things Industries has been covering the costs for the foundation so far. Uh, that's fine, but we want to make the foundation independent, financially independent of us. Uh, and this is one way to do it. Um, private to private peering. That's, uh, that's actually quite interesting. That this is where, um, for example, we have a customer, uh, with their permission, uh, Deutsche Bahn is going to deploy gateways in uh, German railway stations. So let's say uh, they are deploying uh, their private, so this is a private cluster, uh, private gateways in, uh, in the, the Berlin Central Station, and they create a lot of coverage um, for in that area. If they enable peering with the public network, then all the applications on the public network, they also benefit from this coverage. Private to private peering is where, for example, another customer of ours, uh, my devices, um, sells their uh, restaurant in a box solution to, for example, the two hotels that are near this central station. And uh, they also create coverage just for that network, just for that building. But if they enable private to private peering, then these, uh, these two users can also um, benefit from the coverage that they provide. And if one of the gateway has some issues, then the sensors will still work because they are in that coverage area. Finally, um, scaling. This is also for the public network. Um, we, uh, we are, scaling is, is going to be more and more of an issue. We are, we've had, you know, a thousand gateways more in the, in the past few months just because we finally released our Kickstarter gateways. Um, and, and we are growing, growing rapidly in the public network. So we have to account for scaling. So we are scaling across clusters. And that means that we can load balance across different data centers, but also within the cluster, um, we are going to replicate all the microservices. Uh, and this also allows for uh, carriers to adopt our technology and integrate it in, uh, in their public network. Um, and this is also something we do through the industries. So finally, V3, um, we address the public network uh, by enabling, by supporting LoRaWAN 1.1, uh, class A, B and C, uh, the payload repository uh, for private software as a service, private clouds, it's going to be more scalable, more feature complete, uh, easier to use the network. Uh, we enable the peering um, uh, for the um, for the on-premises. Uh, it's going to be very easy to start with just a small network, maybe run an on-premise network from a single binary, uh, but be able to grow that by uh, starting a cluster of, of microservices. Um, for the Pico and offline uh, gateways, it's the same. You can just start with a very simple single binary, just a single gateways, and be able to scale that up. And for LoRaWAN development, we're going to allow you to run the whole stack on your laptop and have a device on your desk and see exactly how it behaves and how the Mac commands work, what, what is being sent, how your device responds to that, uh, and everything else. So that's my presentation. Um, thanks, and I'm here to uh, answer questions. Thank you very much, Johan Stocking. Um, sorry to say, but time's up. And we ah. have an important guest waiting upstairs Very for good. us. Very good. But I'm sure that you have a whole lot of questions about version 3, the almighty stack. Uh, they can start using it this summer, right? Yeah. And if they have questions, there's the workshop tomorrow. Uh, what time? There's a panel on decentralization, I think, in the afternoon, somewhere yeah. at 2, maybe. Yeah.
Okay, so it's then you can address yeah. all your questions to Johan, of course, you know where to find him. So thank you very much on enlightening us on the new version. Thank yes. you. Johan Stokkevin.